All right, welcome. Welcome and uh, good afternoon or good morning or evening, depending on where you are and when you're listening to this, this presentation. I am Brian Sandroff. I'm your host and I'm going to help educate you hopefully a little bit today about a topic that I think is really, really important to understand as far as general health goes. And as it says there on the screen, the inflammation is literally the underpinning of practically every chronic disease that we're trying to either avoid as we get older or to recover from if we already happen to have it. And it's, um, it's important to understand this concept. And so that's why I'm going to take, you know, 45 minutes or so to educate you about this, not just why it's so important and how it affects your body biochemically and all that stuff, but also things that you can do to start to mitigate the effects of, infl of inflammation and maybe make that problem go away for you. Um, so my name is Brian Sandoroff. I'm a traditionally trained pharmacist. This is for those of you who don't know me or haven't met me before. Um, and so for a while, I owned actually two pharmacies in downtown Baltimore and used to stand behind the counter doing that count pour lick stick type and gripe thing that pharmacists do. And after I had been in my store for about 10 years, I wanted to evaluate how well I was really helping my patients. And so I took one uh, category of patients, and that was my blood pressure patients. And I said, all right, I've been giving them medicines for their blood pressure for 10 years now. Is their blood pressure fixed? Can they stop taking the medicine? And when I asked that simple question, I got an answer that one, I didn't expect. And two, I was really um, kind of depressed about, honestly, because the answer is, is that no, their blood pressure isn't fixed. They can't stop taking their medicine. And the tendency is as time goes on, if you have a problem like high blood pressure, is that you start with one medicine and, you know, that controls your blood pressure for a while and then the blood pressure goes up and then you have to take a higher dose of that medicine and then a second and a third medicine. Now, in pharmacy school and in medical training, you know, you're taught that that's a worsening condition and that couldn't be further from the truth. It's not a worsening condition. That's not what's going on here. Elevated blood pressure is a unique way that your body is trying to tell you that something's out of balance. And instead of listening to what the body's saying and trying to fix the problem, what we do in medicine is find a way to turn the volume down. We get that blood pressure to go down. And the body in its wisdom says, no, nah, you're not listening to me, so I'm going to turn the volume back up. And then we give a higher dose or more medicine, so we can play that game our entire lives. Some of us call that the American death ceremony, actually. So this is what I equate it to. If you're driving around in your car and you see that little red oil light on your dashboard light up, you have a couple choices. If you want, you can take it to the mechanic and find out what's wrong and get it fixed, or just take a piece of black tape and put it over the light and you don't see it anymore. Well, for the chronic diseases of aging in medicine, that's what we're doing. Those medicines that we take are nothing more than the black tape. They're just turning down the volume on what the body's saying. And the body in its wisdom turns the volume back up, as I said. And so that put me on a path as a health practitioner to understand health from a different perspective and hopefully help people. Now, I have come to the understanding that the number one killer in this country is not heart disease, it's not cancer, it's not diabetes. The number one killer is misinformation, not understanding the true ramifications of your decisions. And so my work has become a quest to help educate people to understand how their decisions are affecting their health. And if they want different health, they can make different decisions. It really is that simple. Now, obviously, it'll get more complicated than that. And there are lots of mitigating factors, and we'll talk about all those. Now, today we're going to be talking about inflammation, but I want to let you in on a couple of things. Number one is we have a really cool YouTube channel. And if you go to YouTube and you search for Wellbeing GPS, which is the name of our website there, you will find our channel and you can subscribe. And you can see all of the webinars that I've done. And I think there are 37 or 38 of them right now. And this one will be up on the YouTube channel, maybe by the end of the week or early next week. Um, and we've had over almost 100,000 views of all of our, our videos. And you can subscribe. And when you do that, when we put a new one on, you'll get notified about that, even if it isn't one that we happen to do live. And so there are some times when I record uh, the webinars and they go up on there, but you didn't have a chance to know about that beforehand. And so I would encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Number two is, interesting fact, is that I do a live radio show every Sunday morning. It airs 10 o'clock Eastern time, Sunday morning, which is 7 Pacific time. It actually airs live on a station in Arizona, but you can listen to it live right from my website. 
And so when I'm on the air, if you go to the website, a little button will pop up that says, Brian is on the air now. And you click the button and then you can listen live and you can participate. You can call in, talk about, we talk about things like I talk about in the webinars and many, many other things as well. So I would encourage you to come join me on the radio show as well. It's a lot of fun. And you can uh, you can hear yourself on the radio if you want. We also record all of the radio shows and they end up on a podcast. Also, you can get that from our website. So I would encourage you to go to wellbeinggps.com and explore. And um, and if you want to get in touch with me, I'm here for you for that. Email me right through the website or our toll free number in my office is on all over the website as well. And so I really do encourage you to uh, make use of me as a as a resource. Um, sometimes the information that I'm presenting is general information that's important to know and sometimes you might need help in applying that information to you as an individual under your unique circumstances which could be prescription medicines or a unique genetic you know makeup or whatever so feel free to get in touch with me all right so hopefully that's all good and again i just want to remind you if you're listening to this live and you want to um, participate you got a question just type it right into the question box and it'll show up right on my screen all right so i'm getting ready to to get started here inflammation the underpinning of practically every chronic disease now there are two conditions or results that happen because of our lifestyles that are the most responsible for the chronic disease that we suffer from today. And they are how the body handles sugar and inflammation. And it really is that simple. So today we're going to really dissect and try to understand about inflammation, why it's so devastating to the health and how to moderate that. So this is the part in the uh, presentation where I usually apologize. And that's because it's very difficult to understand these processes without getting into some technical biochemical information. I do my best to um, explain these sometimes complicated concepts in ways that are easier to understand, especially if you're not a healthcare professional. I am self-admittedly a bit of a biochemistry nerd. This stuff makes me excited. Hopefully you can hear that in my voice. And as I said, I'll try to share it in a way that'll make sense to you. So let's talk about the biochemistry of inflammation. So what inflammation is, is a complicated cascade of events that really is designed to preserve life. Uh, it begins with one, some sort of insult or injury, and that can be of a physical nature, a chemical nature, or a bio, biological nature. And I'll explain that more in detail as we go along. But what happens is you have some sort of trigger or insult or injury, and that causes the damaged tissue to release some chemicals. They're called cytokines or other sort of chemoattractants is what we call them. And this activates the immune system. Now, let's take a simple example of a physical injury and how this cas cascade of events may happen so you can understand it in practice. So... Suppose you're walking down the sidewalk and you turn your ankle. That's the insult, the stretching of the ligaments and other soft tissues that are around the ankle joint. So those now damaged tissues release those chemicals that I just talked about, the cytokines or other chemoattractants is what we call them. And that activates the immune system and cause some other biological changes to happen. One of those changes is that the blood vessels in the injured area alter in a way that allows for the body to send the recruits into the area to sort of fix things. So you can sort of think of it this way. The blood vessels kind of get a little bit leaky, right? So to continue the discussion now, the immune cells begin fighting the cause of the damage and other cells are recruited into the area. And their, um, their function is varied. Number one is they want to alter vasodilation. That's to allow more blood to the area and the delivery of other factors so that the body can repair the damaged tissue, get rid of the old stuff, build new stuff, and, um, and immune factors can be there to guard against infection that can happen when there's um, some sort of reaction. Uh, platelet activity will alter as well, and this is to stop bleeding. Um, and that's not just bleeding on the surface. We all know what happens if you get a cut then you uh, develop a scab and that's what stops the bleeding. Well, that happens underneath the surface as well. And if you get bruising, that's evidence of bleeding underneath the skin. Seems obvious, right? And then fibro, uh, 
fibrinolytic activity as well. And so this is to break down the damaged tissue. It's like uh, enzymes and proteins that get in there that break down the damaged tissue so that you can remove that tissue or recycle the parts to be used to, to building. This causes what we call the hallmark signs of inflammation. And there's four signs. You know what they are? Pain, swelling, redness, and heat. Those are the four signs of inflammation. And when you hurt yourself, all those things usually happen. Maybe one in more degree than the others, depending on who you are and how you injured yourself. Um, but, uh, you know, that's the case. Sorry, I'm reading a, a question here. This is from uh, KR. And it says, I've recently been diagnosed with psoriasis a number of years ago, uh, microscopic uh, colitis, also high blood pressure and high cholesterol. Any input? Yes. Likely inflammation is playing a role with the development of all of those, what we would call chronic diseases. And so taking a, a look at why that inflammation is happening and how to mitigate that is what this is all about. And so even more importantly for you, this information will be helpful if you take it to heart and you can get those things to literally reverse themselves. All right. So the four hallmark signs of inflammation, pain, swelling, redness, and heat. So this causes tissues to be repaired and inflammation receding. So what I want to make note about also is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or naproxen or even aspirin, right? Although these drugs can help alleviate any or all of those hallmark signs like pain and swelling, but think about this really. If those signs are indications of the body actually trying to fix things, and we interfere with that, then we're actually interfering with the healing process. So in the example of turning your ankle, you take a Motrin and you get back on your feet much sooner than nature would have liked you to. Um, you actually cut down on inflammation, which interferes with the body delivering those factors to the area to protect it immune-wise and to also get rid of the old broken down or damaged tissue and build new tissue. And eliminating the pain actually gets you on your feet sooner, likely leading to actually more damage because you're using tissue that um, isn't at 100% as far as functioning goes. And so when we use anti-inflammatory drugs for an acute inflammatory response, we're actually interfering with the body's attempt to fix things. Just like if somebody has an infection and they get a fever and we take Tylenol, that fever is the body's attempt to raise the core temperature so that offender, whether it's a bacteria or virus, can't live. And we're actually interfering and probably prolonging the infection. And by taking anti-inflammatories, you're likely probably prolonging the, the suffering that you get. All right, getting some questions coming in here. So uh, let's see. Any information or suggestions you have for reducing inflammation for someone with type 1 diabetes is appreciated beyond managing blood sugar control. Absolutely. Joanne, that's a good question. And everything that I'm talking about today, as we get through this, you'll get it and you'll see and you'll understand. Okay. Uh, let's see. Tracy says that she was diagnosed with degenerative disc disease 10 years ago. Now she's got hypothyroidism and high blood pressure and fibromyalgia. It's all connected and it's amazing how it's all connected. Yes, I agree with you completely. And let's see another question. So nutrient rich blood, uh, inflaming a local area is basically healing the tissue. That's correct. You're bringing to the tissue, the factors that the body needs to protect the area, to get rid of the damaged tissue and build new tissue. And the meds uh, removed the nutrients. Not The meds didn't remove the nutrients. The meds um, interfered with the body delivering those nutrients. When you cut down on inflammation, inflammation is literally um, more blood flow to the area and the vessels becoming leaky so that those factors can get through the lining of the blood vessel into the, the other tissue there, if that makes sense. Good questions. Thanks. All right. So let's talk about the triggers of inflammation. So there's Physical triggers, like I just gave you an example of, you know, there's some sort of physical injury, you're in a car accident or uh, something like that. Um, chemical, things like pollen or heavy metals like mercury that you could get from your mental, uh, from your dental fillings or, or fish even, or preservatives and colors and flavorings, all those things are uh, potentially chemical triggers that will cause inflammation. And then there's biological ones. And I'm talking about things like viruses or bacteria or cancer. So as you can see, inflammation is a very complicated cascade of biochemical events that's designed to help preserve life in the face of an insult or injury. 
But what happens when inflammation becomes chronic? That's really the key. So chronic inflammation, what are the effects of underlying chronic inflammation? Well, there's a bunch of them and they all have to do with all of those factors that I just told you about. So number one is immune function. You know, although initially buoyed, the immune system can actually become burnt out where it actually loses focus or the ability to monitor the entire body properly when there's chronic inflammation. Or maybe even worse, the immune system can overreact and become hypervigilant, which is what happens in cases of autoimmune diseases and sometimes even simple allergies where the immune system starts to fight against normal parts of the body when it shouldn't. And this happens because it's constantly being um, driven by inflammation to work harder. Make sense to you? Vasodilation is one of the uh, physiological effects that happens. And this constant quote unquote leaking of fluids allows for more exposure of the tissues to more irritants and triggers. And so if the blood vessels become chronically kind of leaky, then stuff that's going through the blood that may be on the way to the liver to get destroyed and escorted out of the body might leak through and become another trigger of damage or another trigger of inflammation. Sticky platelets, that's a good one. You know, a general condition of platelets that are too sticky or have the tendency to clot inappropriately, that's code for clogging of the arteries. This is why inflammation leads to cardiovascular issues, to heart disease. We'll talk about more. We'll talk about this more um, in a minute. Tissue damage. Remember, inflammation ideally le leads to getting rid of damaged tissue. But if there's no damaged tissue to break down and inflammation exists and the factors that are there to try to break down damaged tissue are there, they're going to break down something and they end up breaking down normal tissue. And it's the same story with tissue growth. Inflammation drives tissue repair. That's growth. But if you don't have tissue that needs to re be rebuilt or repaired, and you have the factors there that say, hey, something's got to grow here, well, then we're going to get inappropriate growth of tissue, and that sounds like cancer, doesn't it? That's why chronic inflammation can lead to cancer. So what are the diseases that are related to inflammation? Well, okay, this is the obvious one. Anything that ends in itis, right? Itis literally means inflammation, and so inflammation of. So arthritis, prostatitis, bursitis, rhinitis, there's a million of them, right? Cardiovascular disease, and again, clogging of the arteries from inappropriate platelet activity and the drive to sort of staunch the flow of blood where none is, is needed leads to inappropriate cl clotting, thicker blood. And that, as we know, is a, is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. But we're talking about diabetes. We're talking about asthma. We're talking about allergies, whether seasonal or chronic. We're talking about immune issues like cancer. We're talking about any sort of autoimmune disease. I'm literally telling you that inflammation is related to the genesis of every single one of the diseases of aging. All right. So... One of the natural questions that you sort of might ask yourself is, why do we have a tendency towards, why do we have a tendency towards inappropriate inflammation? It's a couple different factors here. Number one is genetics. So this is the part that you get from your parents. And this is a tendency, and I've said this many, many times before. So if you've heard this before, it'll be good as a reminder to you. And if you've never heard this before, this should be really eye-opening information. Your genes give you different possible futures. They're like a Star Trek episode. Which future comes to pass depends on how you bathe your genes in your experiences. Diet, exercise, lifestyle, and maybe most importantly, coping mechanisms. And so it brings us to this idea of genetic expression. So what you got from your parents are your genes. You should think of those as your tendencies or maybe even your weaknesses. But whether those weaknesses ever get exposed depends on how your genes express themselves. The reason we see things running in families is because one, the genetic tendency or weakness, but two, what do you learn from your parents? 
diet, exercise, lifestyle, and maybe most importantly, coping mechanisms. So that's why we see things running in families. To me, that is a tremendously empowering statement because there are things that we know of that can get your genes to express themselves in a more positive way. And if that's the case, then you never have to have the same sort of chronic diseases that your folks or grandfolks had simply by doing something different and getting your genes to express themselves differently. Now, there are certain nutrients that play a role with that. We'll talk about that. And there are certain lifestyle factors, and we'll talk about those as well. But understand that your genes can express themselves in a positive way. The tendency towards inappropriate inflammation, part of the issue is a genetic tendency. And there are those of us who have that tendency. Now, that tendency in one person may show up as arthritis and another person diabetes and another person some sort of cancer and another person heart disease. It's that same tendency towards inflammation. More importantly, it's really about the fats. It's about the fats in our diet and how those fats work. So think of it this way. There's two kinds of fats. There are fats that lead to inflammation. They're pro-inflammatory fats, and there are fats that work against inflammation. They're anti-inflammatory fats. Now, please understand that the pro-inflammatory fats, the fats that lead to inflammation, are very, very important. If you didn't have those in your body, your body couldn't appropriately respond with an inflammation response. And so, again, it's life-preserving. And so if there's some sort of injury, your body has to be able to make inflammation. Or if there's some sort of infiltration from an invader from the outside world, like a virus or a bacteria, the way that your body fights that off begins with an inflammatory response. And so those pro-inflammatory fats are very important. But what nature wanted for us, what nature intended, and what was the case in our diet until probably about 150 years ago was a ratio of pro to anti-inflammatory fats anywhere from one to one to two to one. And that's what just happened naturally with the fats that we got in our diet. If you were living in the wild and you ate a deer, the fats that you would get from that deer were about a two to one ratio of pro to anti-inflammatory fats. However, when you introduce the standard American diet, SAD, that ratio gets way out of whack. And what happens today? Anywhere from 15 to 30 to 1 pro to anti-inflammatory fats. Now get this completely. Our tendency towards inappropriate inflammation is partly because of an imbalance of the fats in our diets. Now which are the fats that are pro-inflammatory? They're also known as omega-6 and they come from vegetable sources. And so when we started using vegetable oils to cook those foods that we just love the way it makes them taste or makes them, you know, gives them a texture, that's when we started to increase our uh, pro-inflammatory fats, again, called omega-6s as well. And when we took our livestock and we started feeding them what is the equivalent of vegetable oils, meaning corn, that changed their fats. And so when you have a corn-fed cow, it grows much quicker. It gets to market weight in nine months instead of two and a half years. That's kind of <laughs> that's sort of the definition of fast food right there. Uh, that's why we feed it corn. But think about the fats that are in that corn versus what would a cow normally eat? Grass. And the fats in grass are completely different. So... Um, our ratio of fats that we get in our diet are completely messed up. All right, got another question here. It says, what on earth am I supposed to eat to fix this? More meats or what? Not necessarily. I'm going to talk about diet and how to alter your, your diet appropriately. My feeling is, is that you really can't fix this with your diet alone. You can start to change those tendencies a little bit, but what you have to do is supplement with the omega-3 fats, which are the anti-inflammatory fats, and I'm talking about fish oil. So we'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Thanks for that question. Uh, the question was, what's the alternative to taking an anti-inflammatory in order to assuage the pain of an ankle sprain? Well, 
Okay, so a little bit complicated. Number one is I don't necessarily want you not to have pain from that because that pain is nature's way of you getting off of your ankle so that you actually take care of yourself. Unfortunately, we get all these messages and we have all these drives that we have to get back to work or back on the basketball court and no pain, no gain that Nike tells us and all that stuff. So number one, that's sort of inappropriate, but there are things that you can do to enhance the inflammation process, meaning you can help it get through the process quicker instead of avoid having that process. And when we get to the supplement part, I'll talk about that as well. So thanks for that question. That's a good one as well. All right. So it's all about the fats. You guys got that. And so what we have to do is get our fats back in balance so our inflammatory response will be more appropriate. Now, there is a way to measure underlying inflammation. And there's two ways. I'm going to give you both of them. I think it's important to understand them. Number one is, how's your health? It's really a simple question, but the answer sometimes is not what we necessarily want to see. And so what I say is, is that you have to be really honest with yourself here. So I have patients that come in to see me and I ask them how their health is. And they say, oh, it's great. It's fine. It's perfect. And then they tell me about the prescription medicines that they're taking, or they tell me about how their energy isn't good, or their sleep isn't good, or their mood isn't good. See, we have the tendency to accept that with aging comes decline in function. And I have to tell you that that idea, it's one, it's not acceptable to me. I don't find it acceptable for you. And I would prefer that you don't accept that so easily either. And it's really nothing more than a really potent marketing tool for mes Western medicine. It's just another reason to take another prescription. So you don't have to accept that. And you have to... Um, Honestly evaluate where your health is right now. So if you have any sort of chronic disease, aches and pains, energy or mood issues, hormonal imbalances, immune dysfunction, all of these are your very first indicator that inflammation is probably an issue with you. But we also like to have more objective ways of measuring things as well. And so there is a blood test that's called C-reactive protein. This is a protein that's made in the liver and it is created in response or as a byproduct of the inflammation process, and it is completely measurable. Now, when you do get it tested, you'll see the second little thing there says HSCRP. HS stands for high sensitivity, and that's the blood test that will measure your C-reactive protein as a function of inflammation in your body and will be very, very helpful. Sometimes they call it cardiac CRP as well, two names for the same thing. And so I would encourage you to have this blood test done when you get your normal blood test. Now, sometimes a doctor will say, oh, no, insurance won't pay for it. That's just not true. Insurance will pay for it if you have any sort of family history of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer. I don't know anybody that's listening right now that doesn't have some sort of family history to that. And your insurance will pay for it. And it's very, very important to understand what it is. Now, what are the numbers? Well, ideally, we'd like to see a number of zero. But I can tell you that I have a lot of patients who have that test done. And I've never seen one that's been zero. I've seen one that's been 0.1. I think that was the lowest maybe. Um, but what we want to see is that number below one. Now, the acceptable range on a blood test will go up as you age. And so it might say that what's normal for a 75 year old is actually four or below. Well, that may be typical, but it's not optimal. And so we want to see that number at one or below. I think it's probably impossible to have no measure of inflammation in your body. And that's because your body's always fighting something off. There's always some sort of minor injury. There's some sort of acute reason for it. Uh, some sort of bacteria in the in the mouth, you know, in the mouth or in the body that the body's trying to fight, and that's normal. And so, a slight bit of inflammation, as measured by CRP, is normal. But when it gets too elevated, you can get in trouble there. So, uh, question says, can you repeat what this test checks? It checks quite simply a measure of the inflammation in your body, which is exactly what we're talking about here. Inflammation going on underneath the surface can happen without you knowing it or without you recognizing it. And that's why I think the blood test is really important. 
so that you can see that some alterations are needed. What those alterations are is going to be individual. With some people, maybe that they have to change their diet, and I'll talk about how to do that in a second. Or maybe that they need some supplements, and I'll talk about those supplements in a second as well. So, But it measures the underlying information that may not be apparent that is the underpinning of all the chronic diseases of aging. So it's even more important for you if you have family history of chronic disease. Well, you know, for the most part, our ancestors didn't, um, you know, uh, don't just die for no reason. Usually it's some sort of chronic disease. Okay, I have a question here. I asked my doctor for my CRP test and he finally reluctantly agreed. He asked what I would do if the test indicated inflammation. I told him I'd want to follow up. The number was indeed high and we have yet to follow up. Not sure what to do next. Well, it's really good that you're listening to this webinar because I'm going to tell you exactly what you have to do. And then you can put those into action, whichever ones apply to you, meaning that I'm going to talk about diet and you might find that you're actually doing something wrong even though you thought it was right. That's that misinformation thing. And that's why I say it's the number one killer. And then you'll get the chance to retest it and see if it's gotten lower. And then you'll know you're moving in the right direction. Another question, can stress cause any inflammatory responses in the body? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to talk about that in more detail in a second. But stress is a big issue. All right. How are we going to fix the problems of inflammation then? That's what those questions were just about. And let's get through it. So there's a couple different areas that we're going to discuss. Number one is diet. So balance of fats, very, very important. And so this means decreasing the vegetable oils. Those are the omega-6s and increasing the omega-3s, which mostly come from fish. Now, I got to put a co couple caveats there. So number one is we got to stop using the vegetable oils. We got to stop using them in our cooking and so what that means is if you're eating something that comes out of a package, you really, you got to stop doing that. <laughs> it's just the bottom line. Make your own food so you know exactly what's in there. Or when you are eating food, make them fresh foods, not prepared foods, because those prepared foods oftentimes have oils in them, even in ways that um, or in surprising ways that you don't realize. If you are going to use oils for cooking, you should use coconut oil. Or you could use macadamia nut oil, or you could use grape with a G, grape seed oil. Those are oils that uh, will maintain the integrity of the food better and are healthier for you to use. Or use butter. Butter is a fat that is actually healthier for you than safflower, sunflower, canola. Those oils are awful and we shouldn't use them at all. So that's number one. Number two is you have to balance it by getting the proper fats. And those are omega-3 fatty acids. For the most part, they come from fish. Now, usually some people will ask a question, hey, what about flax oil? Well, flax is a vegetable, that's a source of a vegetable oil that is precursors to omega-3s. But your body has to convert those fats into the fats that it can use as anti-inflammatory fats, which are called EPA and DHA. And many people, as they age, and many people as their fats are out of balance, cannot make that conversion. And so you are much better off using fish oil as, uh, as the way to balance that. I'll talk about that more in the uh, supplement part. Um, let's see, there's a question here. Uh, I heard through, uh, through a thyroid site, you have to heal your gut first. Well, thank you, and that will be slide number two. Smart person there. All right. So sugars and glycemic index. This is really, really important as well. And that's because when you eat foods that cause a quick sugar spike, that is a signal from nature that something has gone awry. And the response is inflammation. Now, for the vast majority of time that you, that we as a species have been on this planet, we have not had grains as a staple in our diet. We really didn't have foods available to us that would cause a quick sugar spike. That only happened with the advent of, you know, what we would call modern agriculture some five to 7,000 years ago. Before that time, we didn't have grains as a staple in our diet. Well, genetically speaking, our body still works like we were cavemen. And under those conditions, anything that causes sugar spike is a signal that something is wrong and the body's response is inflammation. So you have got to stop eating high glycemic 
foods. The glycemic index of a food is how quickly it will cause a rise in your blood sugar. It's not necessarily that it has sugar in it, but how quickly it gets to your bloodstream. And so obviously I'm talking about cakes and candies and donuts and those sorts of things, but I'm also talking about anything that is grain-based, even things that you have been trained to feel are healthy for you, like 12 grain whole wheat bread. For most of us, having a piece of 12 grain whole wheat bread for breakfast, say, or a bagel, is like having a Snickers bar. And if that's the case, I say have the Snickers bar because it is a lot more fun than that piece of 12 grain whole wheat bread. But the result is the same. And that is a sugar spike, which causes inflammation, which in certain susceptible people is going to lead to certain kinds of chronic diseases. It's just that simple. I did a whole webinar about eating grain free and challenged people in that webinar to go two months with not having any grains in their diet and seeing what the results of that are. This is one of those examples of misinformation. If you have a sugar issue, you have diabetes, you've probably been trained that you should have whole grains in your diet. It's the worst possible thing you can do. I usually say that if you're eating a food that says recommended by the American Diabetic Association or recommended by the American Heart Association, don't eat it because they're not healthy for you. They're backwards. And so what I recommend people do is take a two-month period of time, do a little experiment for yourself. Then you'll get an answer. And you know what happens when people go and get off of grains completely for two months? They lose weight or they normalize weight. They gain muscle. They lose fat. They sleep better. Their immune system works better. Their mood's better. They've got more energy during the day. All sorts of things change. If you go through that two-month experiment and you feel different, you lost a few pounds, your clothes are fitting differently, you like your husband or wife better, they like you better, all sorts of things change. And then you say, yeah, you know what? Pizza's more important to me. That is making an informed decision. My contention is right now that you're having foods that you just don't realize are affecting your chronic disease in ways that you could avoid if you wanted to. Hopefully that makes sense to you. I also want to talk a little bit about uh, hidden food sensitivities. So there are proteins that come in certain foods that can be chemical triggers for inflammation. And they usually happen in relation to either incomplete digestion and a condition called leaky gut that someone had asked about that I'm going to talk about a little bit more uh, in a second. The most common culprits are gluten, which is a protein that's in certain grains. I take the whole gluten thing out of the picture by saying just get off of grains completely. Dairy, corn, and soy. There are practitioners out there that do food sensitivity testing. I don't find that testing to be very valid. The only real way to know is to avoid a food for a period of time, two months usually, and see what changes. And you can also see what changes with the C-reactive protein. And you will convince yourself that that number is going down, even if that's the only change that you make. I also, I meant to mention this when we were talking about testing before. If you go to, I, my preference would be you go to your doctor and say, hey, I would like to see what my C-reactive protein is. And they should test it for you and your insurance should pay for it. That's why you pay for your insurance. Sometimes doctors just won't do it or people just don't want to fool with that. There actually is a home test kit that you can get to measure your C-reactive protein. And so if that's something you wanted to do, just get in touch with me in the office and I'll go over prices with you and what to do. And that's a good way of doing something for a period of time, like three months, making some changes, dietary, supplement, whatever, and then retesting to convince yourself that there's actually a benefit to what you're doing. So that's a possibility as well. Okay, got some questions here. Uh, in past, I took fish oil, a Nordic brand, um, and noticed I was passing it in my stool. Do some people have trouble absorbing it? The answer is yes, especially if there is gallbladder dysfunction and or if you've had your gallbladder removed. Because what your body does is it creates bile to be able to emulsify fat into a form that the body can absorb. And so there's likely something going on with that. And that's usually an easy fix, either with taking uh, bile acids or bile salts along with it and or a proper digestive enzyme would fix that problem for you. And so, okay, legit question. I am factor five. Would this contribute to anything? Um, I imagine it would. There are some genetic issues that um, where genetic expression is less uh, available or differences in genetic expression. There are some genetic diseases like uh, Tay-Sachs or sickle cell that the difference between best and worst case scenario are very, very slim. 
for most of the chronic diseases of aging, um, you know, the, the, the difference between best and worst case is a very wide gap. I'd have to do a little bit more research to know specifically whether that, um, you know, how much that plays a role with things. Thanks for that question. Uh, please, here's one more. Please tell me I don't have to give up bacon to pursue wellness. Um, that would really be terrible if you had to give up bacon. So here's what I'd say is that, no, you do not have to give up bacon. You just have to balance properly with other foods. But bacon doesn't have a glycemic index. Um, if the bacon is coming from a pig that was uh, fed more like nature intended, then the fats in that bacon from that pig are going to be uh, more balanced as well. And so, no, you don't have to give that up. I hope you like that answer. Okay, how to fix the problem as far as your gut. Really, really important. Now, someone asked a question about this and, and brought up a very important point. So if gut, number one, your gut is your first brain. And inflammation almost always starts in the gut. And it happens because of hidden food sensitivities, because digestion is not working properly, because of an imbalance of the good bacteria, because of stress. And so you definitely do have to fix the gut if that's an issue. And so taking a probiotic or good bacteria formula is very, very important. I would encourage you to uh, check out, you know, on the YouTube channel, my webinar about probiotics so you, so you can understand that more completely. There's a webinar there about digestion so you can understand it more completely as well. There's a webinar, a really good one about leaky gut. Leaky gut is a condition where because of uh, certain factors, including stress and the shunting of blood away from gut tissue, that the gut cells don't reproduce properly. And when that happens, the gut cells don't work as the uh, gatekeeper that they're supposed to as far as what should be allowed to come into the body and what shouldn't. So vitamins, minerals, amino acids, fats, sugars, those things should get absorbed. You know, something comes along, it's a toxin or it's a partially digested protein that should never get absorbed. When it does, that keys up the immune system. The immune system says, oh, invader, I don't know what it is, but it doesn't belong here. And what does it do? It instigates inflammation so that you can fight against that. So that becomes a chronic condition where we're absorbing things that we never should and we have a problem. And so there's a whole way of fixing that. And that's a good basis to, you know, understand. So I would encourage you to, to explore more about leaky gut. That's really a big issue. How about exercise? I know that a good, uh, a good, uh, amount of the group that's listening today are, are through some associations with some fitness centers. And so that's a really important issue. And there is hard scientific evidence that exercise plays a very important role on inflammation. And here's why. Fat cells produce inflammatory factors, especially the white fat that exists around our middles, usually as a result of stress. So as an organism, we're supposed to have a ceiling on how much fat we can really carry around. But because of eating too many high glycemic foods, you should translate that as meaning grains and grain-based foods, as well as obviously sugars, we get insulin resistance and we get leptin resistance. And that leads to a limitless ability to store energy as fat. And we as a species were never intended to be able to do that. When you have fat, fat produces a, um, a hormone that's called leptin. And leptin goes to some glands in your brain like the hypothalamus and says, hey, we have enough stored energy, stop eating. But because of too high fat stores and because of too many processed and refined carbs in our diet, we get this thing called leptin resistance. So we have fat, the fat produces leptin, leptin goes to the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus turns its back and says, I don't see you, I don't see you. And then we never curb our appetite appropriately. And then we just make more and more fat and the leptin doesn't get hurt and, and then we get problems. So um, that's, that's where exercise can help because obviously when you're exercising, you're using up your fat stores, right? Number two is, is that when you use muscles, they actually create anti-inflammatory chemicals. Now that would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? Because when you use your muscles, you get a waste product, which is called lactic acid. Lactic acid causes inflammation. Well, wouldn't it be neat if the body worked in a way so that way when you use your muscles, you also create anti-inflammatory chemicals to deal with that situation of the muscle use. And that's the way nature works. So exercise, very important. How to fix the problem? Lifestyle. 
Well, stress, sleep, smoking, stress, very important. Stress leads to leaky gut because when you're under stress, blood is constantly, shunt, constantly shunted away from your gut. And um, then those gut cells don't reproduce properly. I did a whole webinar on stress. I'd recur, refer you to that. Sleep. I cannot tell you how important it is to get sleep, not just the number of hours, but at the right time. The key time for your body to regenerate and repair, and, and for the purposes of today's topic, you should hear that as the proper way to get rid of inappropriate inflammation is to be asleep between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. And when you're not, your body can't regenerate and repair. And the adage is, is that for every hour that you miss between 10 and 2, it takes two hours of sleep to make up. Sleep apnea and snoring and not oxygenating properly, tremendously stressful to the body. It causes the release of um, cortisol, which leads to all of the other things that we're talking about. I did a webinar about sleep. It's really interesting. I would encourage you to explore that as well. Smoking. I, I, I don't know. I get frustrated that I even need to say this anymore. If there's anybody listening here that does not understand that smoking is bad for you, uh, I don't know. I'm not going to say you're too far gone, but you're hiding your head in the sand. <laughs> Let's say that. And I would like to see you dig your head out of the sand. Um, let's see, I got a question. Can you further explain the effect of stress on gut fat? Okay, two things. Number one, when you're under stress, stress is, a, again, like inflammation, it's a life-preserving um, process. And so, you know, when a saber-toothed tiger jumped in the cave, the, you know, you would kick out cortisol and that would cause some physiological changes that would allow you to better withstand that encounter, either to run away or fight and then repair from whatever damage. And then the saber-toothed tiger leaves and everything comes back to normal. Well, when you're presented with a life-threatening situation, the last thing that your body needs to worry about is digestion. So when you're under stress, blood is shunted away from the gut to muscles and eyes and brain so that you can run or fight and repair. When you're under chronic stress, you're constantly shunting blood away from the gut, which means that gut cells cannot reproduce properly, and then you get this leaky gut thing. The other part of it is that when you're under chronic stress, the body is attempting to protect the organs, and that's why you get fat around the middle. And that's the unhealthiest kind of fat. We call it white fat. And it's the unhealthiest kind of fat. So that's the link between stress and, um, and this whole topic. And again, did a whole webinar about it. So I would encourage you to uh, explore a little bit. Um, let's see. Certainly wanted to avoid doctoring myself here, but I'm curious. When dealing with enough stress, I experience sharp stabbing pains in my stomach that prevent me from eating but I have no ulcers. Is this by chance an inflammatory response? No question it's an inflammatory response and there's other parts of that as well. The truth is, is that your gut is your first brain. It's not your second brain. There's more neurotransmitter activity in your gut than there is in your brain. So when you're upset, when you're nervous, when you're anxious, you feel it, many people feel it in their gut, like you're describing. So I would really encourage you to go to the stress seminar webinar and go to the leaky gut webinar, and you will educate yourself about that as well. Um, can meds like Prilosec help? Nope, just the opposite. And um, there's a webinar that I'll be putting up in the next two weeks that's about um, reflux. Um, the medicine made a big mistake when they invented and started using those medicines. When I was in pharmacy school, Zantac was the very first one of that class of those kinds of drugs, and it was designed for someone to take for six weeks to let their ulcer heal. And it's turned into lifetime medicine, and it is dread in many, many regards. The question we should have asked is, what can we do to keep acid in the stomach, not eliminate acid? Because that acid is there for very important reasons, and gut cannot function properly. So all of those uh, you know, H2 antagonists like Zantac or Pepsid or the proton pump inhibitors, which are the more stronger ones like Prilosec or Prevacid, they're, they're ultimately they're poison for you. Does coffee intake cause inflammation, e.g. two to three cups a day? Um, yes, for a couple of different reasons, but mostly because of the adrenal burn. And the way to try to explain it is, is that caffeine is a loan shark on energy. And so you get energy from it. That's why we like it. And that's why we find that our consumption of it goes up as time goes on. But what we don't realize is that our baseline of energy is starting from a lower and lower place. And so it's bad for your adrenals, which then affects all the rest of it. All right. So how to fix the problem? Supplements. And this is uh, this is a big part to pay attention to. So number one are the healthy fats, as I talked about. And the way to do it is fish oil. Now, let me say, I am not shy about talking to you about brands as well. There are a lot of 
inferior fish oil supplements on the market, either because of how they're processed or their potency. Um, and so there are a couple that I recommend um, depending on you know certain factors. But far and away, my favorite one is one called Whole Mega by a company called New Chapter. And the reason I like it is because they don't concentrate to just EPA and DHA. Literally, if you saw a chemical analysis, you'd see that it has dozens of omegas in it that play a role in incorporating into cell membranes so that those cells can communicate more appropriately. Fish oil is anti-inflammatory, helps lubricate joints, healthiest thing you do for your heart, healthiest thing you do for your brain, your immune system. Earlier, I talked about um, genetic expression, and there are two supplements that are known to play a very important role in getting genes to express themselves in a positive way instead of a negative way. One of them is fish oil, the other is vitamin D that I'll talk about in a second. Then there are a whole host of anti-inflammatory herbs. Turmeric, ginger, rosemary, boswellia. There's a bunch of different ones. And I like the combination products. And so there's a product called Zyflamend, Z-Y-F-L-A-M-E-N-D, by a company called New Chapter. Same as the, the whole mega. And it's a combination of very potent anti-inflammatory herbs. And you should take two of them every day just for general inflammation purposes. And if you go and get your C-reactive protein checked and it's elevated, you're gonna make the changes in your diet like I told you about. You're gonna take fish oil and you're gonna take Xiflamend every day and you're gonna do that for three months and then you're gonna get your C-reactive protein checked again and you're gonna see it's much lower. This is the most potent way to reduce inflammation in your body. Um, then I wrote enzymes there. And so someone had asked earlier about what do you do to get through the inflammation instead of stop the inflammation. And so you use pancreatic enzymes taken on a, an empty stomach, or you use a uh, proteases like bromelain, which comes from pineapple, um, on an empty stomach. So it's not really helping with digestion. It will get absorbed systemically and it will hurry the inflammation process. So these enzymes will find their way to that damaged tissue and make it easier for your body to get rid of that damaged tissue to get on with the repair part. And that's how you hurry through an inflammatory response for a chronic injury as opposed to slowing down the process with an anti-inflammatory medicine, if that makes sense. And then, as I said, vitamin D controls over 3,000 genes in the human genome. So you got a question here that says, what about being vegan? All right, this is a difficulty um, because I know a lot of very unhealthy vegetarians and vegans. And please understand, I say this with respect. I am a reformed vegetarian. And what happens when you are a vegetarian is, well, what happened for me and many people that I know is that you rely on sources of proteins that are not healthy for you, like soy, or you become protein poor. And so you can be vegan. It's very hard to get proper amounts of healthy fats if you're vegan. Very, very hard. And so you have to take tons of flax oil and really avoid all of the other vegetable oils to be able to convert that flax oil into the appropriate anti-inflammatory factors in the body. The problem with the vegetarian is, is that they get a lot of those vegetable oils because they're not eating meat. And they um, have a tendency to have a lot of grains in their diet. And so um, my experience is, is that I don't think that we were designed to be vegan. Genetically speaking, our history doesn't speak to that. And it actually interfe interferes with health after a while. And so it's a tough, it's a tough way to, um, to go through it with this. And I know a lot of vegans and vegetarians who think they're doing it for health reasons that end up being very, very unhealthy. Okay, here's a question. Do you, would you treat individuals with Crohn's who are on Remicade infusions every six to eight weeks? Yes. Now, I want to be clear about this. Oftentimes, when people are on prescription medicines, we don't say, here, take this instead of that. We say, look, if you do these things, the need for that is going to start to go away. And I've seen that happen with people that have serious health issues that are on serious medicines like Remicade. And so I do think it's entirely possible for you to uh, get off the of grains, get your gut functioning the way it's supposed to by using anti-inflammatory factors, by using probiotics and digestive enzymes, 
and that the need for the Remicade, in essence, the Crohn's, will go away. That is possible. Whether that happens with you or not is hard to know, but it certainly is worth trying, and I'm happy to help you help guide you through that process if you'd like. So thanks for that question. All right, so just to wrap it up, in conclusion, inflammation is life-preserving, but it was meant to be an acute process, not chronic. Chronic inflammation leads to diseases, and you have the ability to moderate this. All right, now's a good time to type in any more questions. Can you recommend a probiotic by name? Yes, absolutely. The one that I use most often, and there's a whole science about this as well, and there's a lot of products out there that are lousy, like TrueBiotic. The ones you see advertised on TV are awful. They're, very, they're not very potent. Um, or that, you know, that yogurt stuff, not very good. So I did a whole webinar about this, but the product that I use, here's the short story, is by a company called Healthy Origins, and it's called Probiotic. It's completely shelf-stable. 30 billion bacteria per capsule, guaranteed until time of expiration. You have to understand, most of the probiotic products out there, when they give you that potency, they tell you that's potency at time of manufacture. But by the time it makes it from the manufacturer to the wholesaler to the retailer to you, oftentimes there's nothing live in there anymore. These are guaranteed potency until that expiration date. It's a multi-strain formula. I think it's eight strains in it, and it is the most cost-effective. A bottle of 60 we sell for $20. And that's the probiotic I use with all of my patients, and it's a really excellent one. You go to our website, you can, um, uh, you know, order it right off of there. You'll see our, our shopping cart if you can get it, you can like uh, if you'd like. Um, I also just want to remind everybody to go to the YouTube channel, do a search for Wellbeing GPS, and subscribe. I love to see my subscriber numbers go up, and look at all the different webinars. Understand that the number one killer is misinformation, and it is my mission to change that fact, to really educate people so that you can be one of those people walking around saying, I used to have, and then fill in the blank, diabetes or Crohn's or, or whatever. Um, let's see, some questions here. Okay, so what's the website? Come on, it's down there in the right-hand corner of every screen that you're looking at, wellbeinggps.com, your navigation tool to being well. Yes, I, I, I thought that went up all by myself. Uh, Trixie said, superb presentation. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. What is considered a high quality omega-3 oil supplement? Is Melaleuca one of them? No. Melaleuca is not. Uh, I mean, they may have a fish oil. Melaleuca oil is not an omega-3, and that's not one to be used internally. That's, that's tea tree oil. What we're talking about is a quality fish oil. So explore whole mega by new chapter. Let's see. Uh, I got a question. I am trapped in a vicious cycle of sleep apnea hypothyroid, and high blood pressure. I can literally feel the inflammation in my body. How would you recommend starting to reverse all those things? Well, it's complicated. I'd want to take a look at your, uh, your stress levels. I'd want to uh, alter your diet. Um, dairy plays a very important uh, negative role with sleep apnea. Hopefully, you're on a CPAP and you're starting to address that. I would do some adrenal support. I would get your gut into shape. It's going to depend on some other factors, and I'd have a million questions for you. So I would encourage you to call me in the office one time or email me, and let's make a time to talk so that we can um, uh, you know, go through that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Someone just typed in a question, and I uh, deleted it instead of uh, pushing it up. Something. Uh, sorry about that. If I didn't address your question, type it in again. Uh, let's see. Definitely going to subscribe. Is there any... Uh, access or contact that us followers to utilize your guys' intelligence to help guiding ourselves should specific questions come along. Yes, call me. That is what I'm here for. I work as a resource to help take this information and apply it to you as an individual. And so prescription medicines, family history, conditions that you're working on, supplements that you've tried, lifestyle, all those things I want to know about in more detail. And anybody that's on this webinar, I am happy to do a session with you on the phone or in person if you happen to be in the Baltimore area or we can Skype if you want to, you know, if we want to look at each other and, um, and help you make some changes, get on the right products, and then monitor you as you go through that process. What's a fair time to um, see results? I usually tell people you got to think of things as a two-month experiment. Now, I'm not promising that at the end of two months, all your problems will be gone, but you will have made enough progress so that you know that we're, we're barking up the right tree. Things are changing. You're feeling better, whether that's the quality of your sleep or your energy or your immune or all those things that I talked about. Everybody, thanks so much for uh, joining me. Let's see. Uh, two more questions. Phone available on the website? Yes. Uh, yeah, if you go to wellbeingGPS.com, uh, our toll-free number is plastered all over it. Um, should we increase the intake of milk or decrease for better health and reduced inflammation? 
milk is a problem. Milk that comes from a cow or from a sheep or from a goat is different than milk that comes from a human. It has a form of a protein called casein in there that the human body cannot break down and that becomes a trigger for inflammation. And so getting off a of dairy is a big deal. Raw is better as far as milk goes. Is that what you mean, Laurie? You are 100% right. And that's because if you have raw milk, at least that has the enzyme in it to break that, um, that form of casein down. Still not a big fan of dairy all the way. One last question. Do you recommend Reiki or acupuncture modalities to enhance the effects of these recommendations? Yes, no question about it. My wife is an amazing energy healer and she does Reiki and things far beyond that um, to help people. And the result is that their bodies work differently. And so, yes, I'm a big fan of exploring all sorts of tools out there. Everybody, thanks for joining me. I really do appreciate it. I encourage you to get to the YouTube channel and to um, subscribe. I encourage you to get in touch with me with some questions, and I'm happy to try to help you move forward, and I encourage you to stay in touch. I believe in October we're going to be doing a webinar about um, removing toxins from the body and taking people through a seven-day cleanse. And um, so I encourage you to you know stay in touch, really. Um, thanks, everybody, so much, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.